In this video, we're going to learn how to find the magnetic field of an infinite sheet of current. And so here I've, I've drawn what I think an infinite sheet of current looks like. We've got a current density K, and K is actually a linear current density. So K is current per unit length. So if I take some segment of this plane, so I take some length here, the total current in this little segment, I, would be equal to K times the length of this segment. So that's just what linear current density means. It's typically used when you have current flowing along surfaces. And let's say that we want to know the B field at some height away from the sheet H. So we want to know the B field as a function of the height away from the infinite plane. Now, because this problem has a lot of symmetry, that means that we can use Ampere's law. So we can use Ampere's law to figure out what the B field is. And remember that Ampere's law says that the integral of B dot dr around some closed loop is equal to mu naught times the current that is penetrating through that loop. But it's not entirely obvious what kind of symmetry we can use. Like, you know, when we had lines or cylinders, we could use a, a circular loop as our curve. But what, what on earth are we supposed to do with an infinite plane? And to figure that out, let's zoom in on the plane and let's look at it from this angle. So let's look at the plane as if it's flat. And we know that the current, so if we look at it in this angle, the current is going to be flowing away from us. So I'm going to draw that with some X's going into the board. And we also know that the magnetic field from each of these is going to be in a little loop around each of the segments. So the magnetic field due to this center current is going to look something like this above, and it's going to look something like, I don't know, something like this below. It's going to be sort of curving around. Now the magnetic field for this guy on the right is going to also be curved, so it's going to look something like this. It's going to look like that. And straight above, it's going to be horizontal and to the right. So let's call this the x-axis and let's call this the y-axis just so we can talk about uh, directions. And similarly, on the bottom, it's also going to be curved, so it's going to look something like this. It's going to be curved, and it, it goes all the way around in a circle, but to avoid cluttering it, I'll just draw the top and the bottom. And the, finally, the, the magnetic field due to this little segment of current is going to look something like this. So it's going to be horizontal straight above, and then it's going to be curved on the sides. So it's going to be horizontal below, and then it's sort of going to curve up something like this. Now you might notice for this center little element of current, so this little K times DL, let's say, a little tiny little line of current, the magnetic field due to that piece of current is pointing straight to the right. And the magnetic field from the current element to the left is pointing sort of down and to the right, so in the negative y and positive x direction. But the magnetic field from the current element to the left, or to the right, is pointing up and to the right. And it turns out that these two will actually exactly cancel each other out. And so the net magnetic field above the middle segment of current is actually going to be pointing to the right above, and for this, by the same reasoning, to the left below. But we can make the same exact argument for this particular current element, because it's got a friend to the left and a friend to the right. And this keeps going on and on and on forever. So the magnetic field above the plane of current is actually always going to be pointing to the right. And the magnetic field below the plane of the current is going to be pointing to the left or in the negative x direction. And this is because there's just as much current to the left as there is to the right, and they cancel each other out because this is an infinite plane. So the only component that remains is a component of the magnetic field that's pointing horizontally. 
So now all we need to do is figure out what kind of surface we want to apply or what kind of loop we want to apply for using Ampere's law. Let's clean this up a little bit. So because we know that the magnetic field on top is pointing to the right and the magnetic field on the bottom is pointing to the left, then the kind of loop that makes the most sense to me, let's get rid of these old arrows, the kind of loop that makes most sense to me is one that is horizontal on the top and horizontal on the bottom so that our integral is nice and simple. And because it has to be a closed loop, so remember Ampere's law says that the integral around a closed loop of b dot dr is equal to mu naught times the current that's penetrating through the loop, we need to close off this loop. So I'm just going to do that with a couple of straight lines. So a straight line here and a straight line here. And I'm going to make these distances the same. So I'll call this distance h, and I'll call this distance h. Because we don't know what b is. b might be a function of h. We, we just don't know at this point. We, it might depend on the distance from our infinite sheet. So let's actually solve this. And so let's start with the right-hand side, so b dot dr. And let's start with the region, because B is different above and below the plane of current, let's start with the top region. So in the top region, B as a function of H is just, it's just some magnitude B. We, we don't know what that is, but it's pointing in the X direction. So there's only an X component. Let's, so let's call this direction X and this direction Y. And so B dot dr so dr in Cartesian coordinates is x hat times dx plus y hat times dy. So because b only has an x component, we don't need to worry about the y hat times dy. And we know that, so b dot dr is just going to be equal to the dot product of dr and b. And because they're pointing in the same direction, this is just b times dx. And so I'm going to call the x component b just for simplicity. So now what happens when we try to integrate this around on these vertical sections, so the line segments in y? Well, we're integrating b dot dr from a value of x equals 0, let's, let's call this 0, to a value of x equals 0. So it doesn't matter what's inside the integral, this is going to end up being zero because our path is only changing in y, but there's no dy in our, uh, in our b dot dr term. So we don't end up, these vertical sections don't end up contributing anything. And that's true both on the top and the bottom. And that's great, that makes our life nice and easy. That means we only need to worry about this top horizontal line. And so that we want to integrate from the starting point, which I've called x equals zero, to, and I, I haven't told you what the length of this rectangle is, so let's just call it L for now, because I'm hoping that it won't matter because it seems a little contrived, uh, but we'll, we'll just leave it in for now so that we can actually do the problem. So we'll start at zero and we'll end at L, so zero, L, and because of the infinite symmetry that we have, B is a constant, so we can move it out of the integral. So b times the integral of 0 to l of dx. And this is my absolute favorite kind of integral because we're just adding up all the little line segments. So this is just equal to b times l. So this work was all done for the top segment, so for the top half. But now we need to worry about the bottom half. So what is b dot dl over the bottom half? Well, the vertical lines... Uh, again, those don't end up contributing anything to our integral. So the only thing that we need is we need to find b dot dr for in, in this region, and we need to integrate it from L to 0. So in this case, b is actually pointing in the minus x direction. So b dot dr is negative b times dx. And we're integrating that from an x value of L to an x value of 0, so from L to 0. 
from L to zero. Now we can flip these bounds and add a negative sign. So, and pull while we're at it, let's pull the B, which is constant out front. So from zero to L, we're integrating dx. And this is exactly the same as our integral on top. So it turns out that this also contributes a B times L. And remember, keep in the back of your head that this B might be a function of H. We just don't know at this point. So that was the left-hand side of Ampere's law. Now what about the right-hand side? What is I pen? Well, as I've drawn it, I've sort of drawn our sheet, even though it's a continuous sheet of a given current density, I've drawn it with a bunch of little current segments, which have a, a current amount K times DL, or because this is the X component, the current amount is k times dx, k times dx, k times dx. So we could do an integral to find out the total amount of current that's penetrating through our loop, or we could just say, well, it's our we're capturing a length L of the current sheet, and we know that the current density k is defined in terms of the current per unit length, so this means that the total current penetrating through our loop has to be k times the length. And so this is our I pen. We, we're capturing some length L of the current density, and so our total penetrating current is k times L. You could also do an integral of k dx from zero to L, and you'd get exactly the same answer. And so finally, we're ready to answer our problem. So we know now that the integral, the closed loop of b dot dr is equal to the top plus the bottom, so b times l plus b times l. And this is equal to mu naught times the penetrating current, which is k times l. And look at that! Isn't that absolutely beautiful? The l's cancel, so we don't, we don't actually have to worry about them. And we have that 2b on the right, we have 2b is equal to mu naught times k. Or, finally, b as a function of h is equal to mu naught k over 2. Now this is interesting. This means that b actually isn't a function of h. It's a constant. So no matter how far above or how far below you go, the, mag the magnitude of the magnetic field stays the same. And this is very similar to the result that we got when we were applying Gauss's law for an infinite sheet. In that case, there was an epsilon naught and a sigma, but it's the same, it's almost the same exact type of, the same exact form of the answer here, which is really interesting. It's sort of, I don't know, it's kind of cute. It's even got the factor of two on the bottom. Finally, I'd like to thank all my patrons on Patreon. Your support is greatly appreciated, and it is you who makes these videos possible. If you aren't currently a patron, to get early video access, behind-the-scenes footage, exclusive content, and join a like-minded community, click the link on screen or in the description below. Thanks for watching.